Please be seated. Your Majesty, the King and Queen of Sweden, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the second part of the seminar on the role of forestry for sustainable development. C4 is honored to host their majesties the queen, the king and queen of Sweden at C4 headquarters in Bogor. C4 and Sweden have a strong ties from the founding of C4 in 1993 by Sweden, Switzerland, Australia, and the USA. Together with the Indonesian government, to C4's current director general, Dr. Peter Holmgren, who is a Swedish national, C4 is co-hosting the Southeast Asia division of, at ECRAF, whose incumbent director is also a Swedish national. So together here, Indonesia and Sweden is making this strong ties ever uh, stronger than before. C4, Sweden and Indonesia shared a vision, the vision of a more sustainable world in which forestry research and innovation plays a very, very critical role. Sweden's sustainable forestry practices, where the replanting of trees to compensate the cut trees has been mandatory for more than a century, are aligned with C4 and Indonesia's ongoing effort to highlight and disseminate sustainable forestry practices locally and globally. So today it is an honor to be here in one room where we have all the distinguished researchers who will share their experiences, the lessons learned with everyone here and also at the global level to share the knowledge. How is it that we can achieve sustainable forestry for sustainable development? In the next one hour, there will be six speakers. The first speaker is a welcome address and also reframing about forestry and sustainable development, which be presented by the Director General of C4, Dr. Peter Holmgren. So that, uh, let us welcome Director General of C4 to present his welcome remarks. Thank you, Dami, for that introduction. Your Majesties, your <laughs> just checking the sound there. Your Majesties, Excellencies, colleagues and friends. I recently visited the forest faculty in Umeå, in the north of Sweden, where Anne Sophie and I studied forestry once upon a time. It's a good feeling to be back. And it struck me again how much Sweden and Indonesia can learn from each other when it comes to forestry. Today we have a moment to demonstrate how important forestry is for the future we want. Something is happening with my presentation. Sorry about that. Today we have a moment to demonstrate how important forestry is for the future we want. We want sustainable development for all. And in this seminar we want to show how forestry contributes to every dimension and all the goals. So if we talk about eliminating poverty and hunger, improving health, building smart cities, providing water and renewable energy, education, ensuring rights, gender equality and equal opportunities, building strong institutions, securing climate on earth, conserving and restoring life on land and underwater, making reliable investments and value chains, and building new partnerships, and perhaps most of all caring for the well-being and future of our children and their children, and so on. Forestry embraces all of this, and therefore is what our efforts at C4 are about. 
Our strategy, as you can see on the screen, is designed to contribute to all of the 17 sustainable development goals that the world has agreed on. Through our research teams, we ensure that focus is maintained on each aspect of the SDG framework. In contrast, in the public debate among advocacy organizations, in national policies and in the international negotiations, we usually hear about forests as an environment issue. Global challenges such as climate change, ending deforestation and protecting wildlife take up most of the bandwidth in media. And of course, these are real and very, very important challenges. But unfortunately, the priorities and needs of lo local and rural communities seldom make the headlines. Communities which are often among the world's poorest and disadvantaged. This is where the benefits and opportunities of forestry come together and have the greatest impact, and this is where our focus needs to be. So seeing how the wealthy parts of the world consider forests, one could say that forests have been put in the global environment corner. And to that I say, nobody puts forest in a corner. Let me turn to the topic of research. Everyone here in the Global Forestry Hall agree that research is an essential ingredient in development. This is why CIFOR and our sibling organization, ICRAF, deliver high quality science that is credible and relevant for policy and practice. This is the core of our mission. But science is under threat. Defending the credibility and relevance of science has become a mission in itself. We live in a world where post-truth populism and alternative facts often set the political agenda. A world where scientists see the need to take to the streets to advocate for their mission. And in that process, ra risking to profile science as just another special interest. As a result, funds for research are increasingly difficult to mobilize. We feel that pressure as well. It is less politically opportune to invest in science. I want to extend my hope to Indonesia as our host country and Sweden as one of CIFOR's founding countries and a leading forest country in the world to stand up for science in general and funding of forestry research in particular. Science, however, necessary is not sufficient. At CIFOR we are clear that doing excellent research is in itself not enough to achieve the impact we, want, we, we aspire to. So that is why we also emphasize learning. We help develop a forest faculty in Eastern Congo. We support Indonesian students to acquire master degrees overseas. We carry out a variety of trainings and prepare educational material. Learning based on science is the basis for that sustainable future we want. We also emphasize outreach and engagement. Forestry research is not worth much unless it is communicated, understood, and ultimately used by many. This, we believe, is also the path to regain a broad trust in science. Post, post truth, if you like. Finally, I want to talk about landscapes and the need for integrated solutions. So much of our future depends on how we manage our landscapes. In the Nordic countries, we share a history of poverty. Many of you recognize this painting from the late 19th century. It's from Finland, but it could have been Sweden. The situation of poor people living off the land. And in our countries, we made a long journey since then. Thing is, we still have this reality in many places around the world. This is a recent picture from Brazil. And I'm sure you can see the similarities. So we can say that if we are to achieve sustainable development, then it is in landscapes we must place our hope. We have a tendency to isolate sectors as experts and to isolate institutions. But in the landscapes, the solutions must come together across agriculture, forestry, mining, energy, water, finance, infrastructure, tenure, rights, and law. We don't seem to pay enough attention on how this integration is to happen. 
And actually, real landscapes are where our science and research can become most useful for people. This is why integrated landscape approaches has become an important foundation for CIFOR's work. We challenge the conventional institutional fragmentation and seek new ways of collaborating and discovering opportunities and solutions. It's not always easy. Habits, safety and comfort in our own subject, on our own sectors, in our own institutions may make us feel threatened. The roots are deep. So we need to work in new partnerships. CIFOR is leading the Global Landscapes Forum, which has become a platform for thousands of partners from every sector and walk of life. And we want to advance sustainable landscapes. In the next five years, we aim to reach and involve one billion people as a global community of landscapes. We think that like the World Economic Forum, the Global Landscapes Forum is on track to become a major positive factor for sustainable development, founded in research and focusing on local priorities. So, Your Majesties, Excellencies, it's been a privilege to share some thoughts about the breadth, of, breadth and diversity of forestry. It's also a privilege to work with all members of the C4 Global team really make a difference that counts, proving how forestry and landscapes can enhance environment and well-being for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, our next speaker is the um, Senior Advisor to the Minister of Environment and Forestry for Industry and Inter International Trade from the Ministry of Environment and Forestry Indonesia. Let us welcome Ibu Laksmi Dewanti. The floor is yours. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good afternoon. Your Majesty, King and Queen of the Sweden, Excellencies, distinguished uh, participants, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, Allow me to convey a best regard from the Minister of, of, of uh, for the Environment and Forestry. Uh, let me convey her message. It is my great honor and pleasure to welcome His Majesty, King and Queen of the Sweden in this uh, nice city of Bogor. And I wish you to have a very successful uh, visit in Indonesia. On these occasions, uh, I would like to also ex uh, express my considerable gratitude to the Sweden delegates. I also would like to extend my sincere appreciation to the C4 in collaborations with the Sweden's uh, Swedish Embassy in Jakarta to organize this important event. The role of forestry for the sustainable development, indeed, is a very challenging topic and it's timely relevant with the present situations especially to the environment and forest sector in Indonesia. I'm sure this, this event will highlight a strong role of forests uh, for the sustainable development goals through exchange of knowledge, information, experiences, visions, know-how between all of us here in this event. Majesties, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants, Indonesia is a country which is blessed uh, with remarkable forest resources. It's a place for abundant species of flora and fauna as regard to the mega biodiversity. Since the Earth Summit in 1992, Indonesia has been actively promoting the implementations of sustainable development, both at the national and international levels. Indonesia always concerned to all international commitments on in environmental and forestry both legally and illeg uh, non-legally binding documents. To some extent, the government of Indonesia has already ratified legally binding documents into laws and government regulations and implemented it at the grassroots levels. In relation to the sustainable development, Indonesia has already launched the Agenda 21 documents, overview the implementation of the agenda, evaluate the progress of the Millennium Development Goals and now we adopted 
the uh, 17 goals of the Sustainable Development Goals into the National Development Plan documents. Indonesia has been conducting its way to sustainable development step in stepwise with a key progress, challenge, and way forward. In order to meet future generations' needs, Indonesia has to balance social, environment, and economic aspect of development. We believe that the Asian Shell Platform of Sustainable Development in Indonesia is a good governance, democracy, people welfare, and high quality environment. To respond, this platform, Government of Indonesia, has been promoting collaborative action on all development activities toward the sustainable economic development. At the national levels, President Jokowi began his presidency by setting the nine priorities agenda called as Nawacita, that defines nine sector-specific outcomes which represent a huge opportunity to strengthen collaborations or coordinations among sectors. Namely, national priority, for instance, address to mandate the develop uh, food security, health security, education, energy security, tourism, poverty alleviation, and infrastructure. This interrelated national priorities program has opened our mind to have a broader vision in seeing the resources of this country, including forest resources as well as, well as human resources with their diversity and complexity. A proper valuation of Indonesian natural resources, including forests, is important and required to demonstra demonstrate the optimal value of forests for people to serve as a strategic planning to our forest asset and seeks to balance the economic, social, and ecological aspect of the forest, and hence to meet the visions of our nation to elaborate the national priority agenda. Majesties, Excellencies, and distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, this priority agenda forces us to think and move our national in maintaining environmental quality, protecting forest resources, and balancing ecosystem and the presence of, uh, of resources in an integrated way. Addressing the roles of forest ecosystem would need to consider several aspects and approach, including institutional and policy regulations and with support from research and innovations toward uh, appropriate action and practice. In order to respond to sustainable development, we have already set up a forestry as a pillar for sustainable development by 2025 as described in Indonesia Forestry Long-Term Development Plan 2006-2020. From this long-term planning, we elaborate five years development plans. For 2015 to 2019, Ministry of Environment and Forestry has issued the strategic plan, which comprised three strategic objectives. First, maintaining environmental quality in order to increase carrying capacity, water security, and community health. Second, utilizing forest resources and environment potential in order to increase economic and community welfare. And the third, maintaining ecosystem equilibrium and biodiversity and the existence of the natural resources as a life support system in order to achieve the sustainable of the livelihood of Indonesia. In this regard, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry has formulated in, uh, environmental and forestry policy priorities, including promoting of sustainable forest management, including the establishment of forest management unit, forest protection and conservation of biodiversity, controlling the environmental pollution and climate change, strengthening the law enforcement and conflict resolution, as well as the uh, management of waste and hazardous waste. The Ministry has also undertaken forestry reform, which hold principles of sustainable use, people-centered, equitability, synchronized, transparency, and integrated. The policy for the forest, forestry reform include action such as macro and micro delineations, giving access to local communities, prudence in permit issuance in natural forests and conservation and conversion, acceleration of rehabilitations, and planting new trees. 
With regard to the policy and regulation, Ministry of Environment and Forestry has launched a new People Forest Policy Strategy to placing foundation for a greater access for the community, especially for those living inside and surrounding the state forest, to utilize forest resources and to resolve conflict. The recent policy is to establish 12.7 million hectares for community forests, including customary forests, private forests, community forest plantation, and village forests. Agroforestry practices, to some extent, can maintain biodiversity and mitigate climate change. This policy is followed and will all followed by the guidance and the practical implementations. Within this new paradigm, Indonesia forests are now being managed in such a way where we could not neglect the demand for the, the, for the development, for the welfare of the societ uh, society, for the sake of the forest sustainability. But we have to create the balance. In the context of the global climate change, Indonesia continuously committed to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions. As we all aware that the world community through the Paris Agreement commit to maintain global temperature increase below two degrees Celsius due it irreversible and will cause a terrible disaster for human lives. In our first national determined contribution under the UNFCCC, Indonesia commit to reduce 29% of its emission by 2030. Out of 29%, 70% emission reduction target comes from the land-based sector, which are mainly forests. Therefore, sustainable forest management has been one of the focus of attention and work of the Indonesian government. And the ministry has been seriously addressing the climate change, and it will also accelerate the challenges of the national growth, including increased adaptability and welfare of the local communities. Excellencies, Majesties, distinguished participants, I believe this event will provide broader perspective on the key developments and challenges for the greater roles of forests on sustainable development. And to conclude, let me reiterate my appreciation to the King and Queen of Sweden, to distinguished excellencies who are present in this room and all the stakeholders for your continuous commitment and support to the sustainable development. I thank you. Bilahi Taufiq wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Ibu Laksmi, on behalf of the government of Indonesia for the remarks. Your Majesties, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The next uh, agenda, there will be presentations from senior researchers and also from our distinguished guest, Ibu Sinta. And um, I have been told by the organizer if there are some um, burning questions that there might be um, opportunity to ask a question, one or two questions for the um, speakers that will come. Um, so let us welcome Professor Ingrid Oborn, Regional Director for Southeast Asia ICRAF. And the title of her role the title of um, her talk will be The Role of Smallholder Forestry and Farming in Sweden and in Indonesia. The floor is yours. Your Majesties, Excellencies, uh, Representatives of Government of Indonesia, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make a talk trying to bring together our two countries. Being privileged to come from Sweden, being a professor at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences, but I've taken the last five years being on leave to work with more global issues. And the last one and a half year I've been here. So the role of smallholder forestry and farming in Indonesia and Sweden, what do you really think um, we can have in common? And to come to that question, uh, I wanted to start to introduce a little bit about the Swedish forestry and farming for all our Indonesian friends. So the total area of land is 41 million hectares, and more than two thirds, nearly 70% of the land is forest land, most of that productive forest. Agriculture, as you can see, is only three million hectares, 
So it's a minor part, but as we all know, also food production, and here very much livestock and dairy production is important around the big lakes, in the coastal zones, and along the big rivers. You can also say that you cannot really be a farmer in Sweden without also being a forester. You can possibly be a forester without being a farmer, but all farmers are also relying on forestry. And the forestry has been very successful. Over the past 100 years, the volume of the standing forest has doubled, thanks to forest policies, thanks to not needing to use charcoal any longer, thanks to not grazing in the forest, and so on. So the forest produce a number of things, timber, paper and pulp, bioenergy, hunting, recreation, and environmental services, and all those products are very important. Looking at the global trade, the ranking of the Swedish forestry products, sort of in export terms, is number three globally, and Indonesia is on the number eight. And the current forestry policy that has been going on for the last 10 years gives equal, um, equal priority to timber production, to the production part, and the environment and conservation, which means that in all forests, in more or less in all forests, all foresters are dealing with production and environment cons and conservation together. Of course, there are a few national parks, but in general, that is like a trade-off that all foresters need to deal with. And there are discussions, but I would say it's working reasonably well. Family forestry dominates Swedish forestry. 50% of the forest land is owned by family forestry, family forestry farmers, and this is producing 60% of the harvested forest products. This is quite a, a lot. And many of those um, family foresters are organized through the Federation of Swedish Family Forest Owners. There are different associations, membership organizations for parts of the country where also parts of the value chains are controlled and owned through their own uh, industries. So this is a way to even having quite small pieces of land and still get sort of access to, to value change, move planting material and, and the products. And what is this? And what does this have to do with the talk? Of course, it's something you find in every farmer's, forester's home in Sweden, maybe most other people. We have coffee, chocolate, tea, teak furniture, rubber boots, and some tires, both for summer and winter, because every car in Sweden has summer and winter tires. It's a good market for rubber. So what does it have to do with Indonesia or other things? It symbolizes that actually smallholder farmers contributes highly to global production of all these items. So did you know, and I hardly knew it myself before I started to look at this, 90% of all cacao globally is coming out of smallholder farmers' uh, production. 75% of the rubber, 67% of the coffee, 25% of the tea, and 20 to 30% of the teak, and which means more than $60 billion worth of trade per year. And looking at more deeply, no, this one we should not have, okay, so, into Indonesia, uh, this shows five major tree commodities. It shows where Indonesia is ranked in the global production. But the key things are the red numbers, where we can see that for coffee, 96% of the area grown by coffee in Indonesia is grown by smallholders. 85% of the rubber area, 94% of cacao, and 46% of tea. That is a huge proportion of the areas in Indonesia. And looking to the far right, where you can see the, the percentage of natural production, you can see that for coffee, it's the same value, 96%. It means that the smallholder coffee is as productive as the plantation coffee. For rubber, you see it's a little bit lower, it's 80%, slightly lower for cacao, and much lower for tea. So it shows that smallholder farming is keeping up. There is still a lot of efficiency gains, sustainability, uh, aspects to do with both social, environmental, and economic sustainability, but smallholder really matters. Here you can see uh, the, the bottom um, 
figure is uh, latex from the uh, rubber trees. And it's very much, I mean, when I think about how smallholders can together work on the rubber, it's very much when you think about many dairy farmers, everybody's having one, two cows when we started the whole dairy factories. You need to milk every day, you need to collect the milk, bring it together. It's the same with the latex. If, if it's waiting there too long, you know, it gets, it gets um, hard. And it really has to be collected, brought together, and farmers need to get organized and get linked to the industry and without too many middlemen and traders who would dilute it, cheat, and do different things. And that is really one of the things discussed in Indonesia now, how the smallholder rubber can be boosted. Yeah. What more can we say about uh, smallholder farming and forestry in Indonesia? We heard a little bit already from the uh, representative from um, Indonesia, Ibu Laksmi. But it's 60, 26 million farmers in Indonesia, which is of course very many more than in Sweden. 50% have some engagement both in agriculture and forestry. So this is really a similarity. The average farm size is small. One hectare can be smaller, can be bigger. And I brought an example here about um, the teak, since we were looking at the teak furnitures earlier on. So in central Java, there is many, one and a half million farmers growing teak, providing a lot of um, of the timber to small-scale industries. We discussed that with IKEA in the first session today. So it's a bit too high-value timber for them, but there are other parts of industries that more can have niche markets where the smallholder teak would be, the, would be an excellent uh, raw product. And as you also can see on the bottom picture, when the teak is small, they are growing ground nets underneath, and when the teak is a little bit bigger, this is ginger production. So you can also have multiple crops on the same land with a smallholder teak. Social forestry was also something we just heard about from the, the government representative and also earlier in the first session. And this is forest managed by communities. So it was initiated in Indonesia as a concept already in the early 1990s. But it is just in a few years back, the government decided to sort of allocate 12 and a 12.7 million hectares of state forest to be managed by communities through social forestry schemes. It can be everything from non-concession peatlands to other non-concession lands, but it also where it is concessions for companies, part of that 20% of the land under concession can still be for social forestry, for agroforestry, because in many of those areas, the people are already there, and the thing is to find out how to work well together between the companies and the local farmers. And agroforestry, the combination of tree crops and livestock, is recognized as one option in the social forestry. So smallholder, to, to conclude, smallholder forestry and farming in Sweden and Indonesia, what are the commonalities? The number of smallholders compared to, to the total number of farmers, is very large in both countries. And smallholders contribute a very high proportion of tree products. And reliable value chains are key, both for the livelihoods and for the sustainable management. And I hope we can explore further collaboration between Swedish and Indonesian farmers. So thank you very much. Thank you. I think um, the 10 minutes is up, so there will be no uh, question. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Ingrid Oborn. Um, the next speaker is Mrs. Cinta Vijaya Kamdani. She is the president of the Indonesia Business Council on Sustainable Development. Silahkan, Ibu. Ada waktu 10 minutes. Your Excellency, His Majesty the Queen and Queen of King and Queen of Sweden, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is uh, truly an honor for me uh, to speak in front of His Majesty and the Queen and such distinguished group of people to address how actually Indonesian private sector move forward to foster sustainability 
of the forestry sector. Indonesian rainforests, as we all know, uh, are the earth, one of the Earth's most bio bi biologically and culture rich landscape. The world's largest archipelago that consists of more than 17,000 islands, spanning between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean, containing the largest expanse of rainforest in all Asia. It is home of hundreds of distinct indigenous languages and over 3,000 animal species. As recently as 1960s, about 80% of Indonesia was covered in forests. Since then, however, the demand for commodities combined with problems such as corruption and land right uncertainty caused massive clear cutting of the rainforests, destro destroying critical habitat for endangered species and sowing social conflict with communities that depend on the forest for their livelihood. And sadly, with current rate of loss, tropical lowland forests, the riches in timber and biodiversity will have disappeared from Sumatra and Kalimantan within the, dec the decade. Deforestation rates have accelerated since 1996 and are now estimated at about 2 million hectares a year. Therefore, the Indonesian government has taken steps to tackle deforestation, especially in prone areas such as Riau and Kalimantan. Not only forests, the Indonesian peatland and swamp is estimated about 13 million hectares, which make, make us the largest tropical peat swamp in the world. Illegal logging, dying up, and land conversion are the main challenges of peat swamp degradation in Indonesia. Responding to the situation, of course, the government realized that forest revitalization is important. They have produced a series of commitment, actions, and policies towards this end. In 2009, Indonesia made a bold move by voluntarily pledging to achieve a 26% reduction in emission against the business as usual scenario in 2020 and for, or 41% with international support. And also, as mentioned before, the National Action Plan on Reducing Greenhouse Gas Emission was soon issued to guide its implementation. To support this purpose, vehicle for financial instrument, the government appointed BAPANAS, to our plan, uh, planning agency, to establish Indonesia Climate Change Trust Fund in 2009. Indonesia also stepped forward to fight for red, reducing emission from deforestation and forest degradation at the 2007 Bali Climate Change Convention and become one of the leading countries in red plus preparation. Also in May 2011, when an MOU, as you know, commitment from Norway of $1 billion was signed, which also act as a major catalyst toward achieving carbon emission reduction target. In the early 2016, the government formed the Peat Land Restoration Agency, where it tasked to prevent forest fire that particularly occur in peatland and to restore such area gutted by it, particularly in Sumatra and Kalimantan Islands. All these are very good, good initiative by the government, but what is actually happening on the field? I guess that's your majesty, what you wanna hear from us, the business. Um, as you know, the Paris Agreement has recognized the role of business as part of non-state actors in climate change governance. It is clear that business is now expected to contribute in reducing carbon emission in any form. Can we do it? First, I would like to share with you some of our challenges. First, fulfilling the National Emission Reduction Plan where forestry sector is expected to contribute around 17% of the reduction. This is a, a very ambitious target. That means our level of business supply chain should feel that they are part of this process, not only the big companies. Second, the increasing awareness of the consumer to an environmentally forest-friendly products. Therefore, 
business should ensure that their products come from sustainable sources. Third, better management practices in business, including respecting indigenous community, is necessary. Maintaining this rainforest and ensuring that indigenous and frontline communities have legal rights to the land are critical to protecting human rights, endangered ecosystem, and our global climate. Community development should be embedded into inclusive business model as it will reduce potential conflict with communities. The fourth, building trust and conflict mitigation. Our research at IBCSD on cost of conflict of land use based company shows that on a per conflict basis, evaluating only tangible costs, the range costs resulting from social conflict ranging from three months to nine years in duration is approximately 700,000 US dollar to over 10 million US dollar. This finding also indicate that the costs relative to conflict are significant, misunderstood and potentially pose a serious obstacle to productivity for companies, communities and the government. There need to be a trust building process between all the stakeholders. I think this is the key, Your Majesty, and this is really where our government, our stakeholder has tried to fulfill building this trust and narrowing the gap between us. It is a very big challenge. On the fifth aspect is also the need of synchronized regulation between central and local government. Different regulation between central and local government is one of the most challenges for us as the private sector. We can't work with many overlapping regulation and inconsistency. What have we done and what are we going to do? So in terms of um, as I mentioned before, the Peatland Restoration Agency, where it, it, it's tasked to prevent forest fire. As you know, forest fire is a very big issue at the moment in Indonesia as well. Some company has actually put initiative in initiating what we call the ecosystem restoration projects and develop new business model to attract investors. So this is a quite a big um, initiative um, for the ecosystem restoration projects and we have started with some still very small number company uh, executing now this for on the implementation level. Um, also, our, on our commitment in land and forest issue, we also have worked uh, together with the Indonesian Chamber of Commerce in working on conflict resolution unit program since 2016, which was established to create public confidence that mediation is an effective alternative dispute resolution, dispute resolution option for resolving land use and natural resource management conflict. The result of the program is expected to provide a range of support services to ensure best practices in this field. We have also um, aimed to accelerate the commitment of company in forestry to eliminate deforestation from their supply chain by playing a role as a regional host organization for Trop Tropical Forest Alliance 2020 for Southeast Asia since 2016. In this program, we expect we can reach the target by 2020 through engaging government of Southeast Asian nation, local and provincial government, NGO, indigenous people organization to focus on how to reduce deforestation and forest fire in a manner that boosts economic growth and people well-being. The question remains, how can we balance critical issues such as economic development, food security, and environmental concern in one of these world most populous and biodiverse countries such as Indonesia, all while remaining competitive and meeting market demands? So these are some answer of the questions that we would like to move forward with. 
First, clarifying land use concession and permit through what we call the one map movement. At the moment, the government doesn't have one map. So this is something that definitely uh, government needs to do to uh, give clarification. Second, facilitating land swaps and collaborative land use planning. Third, identifying and creating incentive for protecting of high carbon stock and high conservation, conservation value forests. Fourth, effectively disseminating best practices to smallholders. And last, creating financial incentive for REP projects. Your Majesty's distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, the Swedes have learned the hard way for not keeping their forests. In the last century, they nearly clear cutting all their forests for agriculture and industrialization. And thankfully, they realized that it was not the right path to take. Since then, in less than 100 years, Sweden forest assets have doubled. The volume of forest continues to increase by a net annual increment. Now, around 70% of Sweden land area is covered by forest. If Sweden can do it, why can't we do it? On behalf of the IBCSD, the private sector of Indonesia, I would like to express my thanks to CIFOR and the Swedish Embassy to help us in sounding the sustainability in forestry as part of sustainable development. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu Shinta. Our next speaker is a senior scientist, social scientist from C4, Dr. Bimbika Sijapati Basnet. And she will be addressing gender issue. And if you realize, actually, all of the speakers are all women here, except Peter. <laughs> so please welcome Bimbika. Thank you very much. Um, his and Her Ma Majesty's, Excellencies, distinguished guests, and um, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Bimbika Sejapati. I'm a social scientist and gender coordinator at, the, at C4. Um, today, I'm going to give you a brief overview of how C4 is addressing gender and rights in our research globally, including in Indonesia. And in the process, I will represent my own views and also summarize um, many of my uh, colleagues' work who are present in this room today. So, okay. So the forestry sector has a long history of engaging with gender issues. For instance, in my home country, Nepal, women's inclusion in forestry programs dates back to the first master plan in the forestry sector in the late 1980s. But for gender issues to be considered seriously in forestry policy, practice, and research, it had to be framed in terms of how gender equality and women's empowerment would contribute to sustainable forest management, reduce deforestation, poverty reduction, and other environmental and developmental goals. As a researcher, practitioner, and someone actively following progress on women's rights, both globally and in my own country, I found these concerns relevant but inadequate for three reasons. First, why cannot gender equality and women's rights be goals in and of themselves? Why must they be viewed principally as instruments for reaching other objectives? After all, there are glaring and persistent inequalities in rights, resources, and representation in, in, in most of the developing countries and the forestry sector has much to contribute to addressing them. For instance, research in India has shown that uh, reducing deforestation can augment access to forest foods and income and are particularly important for poor women. So, and I saw that women, just as men, are differentiated along class, caste, and other social differences. And women, just as men, are not conservation friendly if there are no adequate incentives in place, if their entitlements over resources such as land are insecure, and if the responsibility for caring for children and elderly falls disproportionately on their shoulders. So just adding women is, ju is just not sufficient to guaranteeing better forest management outcomes. 
when women are just added into existing forestry and conservation programs without thinking through how these policies and programs could also be beneficial to them, then women's presence is just tokenistic. And even worse, existing gender inequalities are heightened because women now need to add participation in forestry projects and programs alongside everything else that they have to do every day. Under the Global Framework on Sustainable Development since mid-2000s, I have witnessed a substantial change. The MDGs recognize gender equality and women's empowerment as a goal in, of, in and of themselves and also integrated into other development goals. But the SDGs has gone further and included many of the underlying causes of gender inequalities such as access to land and resources, distribution of care, that women's movement have been advocating for many generations. The Swedish government's feminist foreign policy 2015-2018 and efforts to channel support and funding in a way that strengthens women's rights, representation, access to resources, serves to add further weight and legitimacy to these global agreements. At C4, we've embraced these broader changes and aligned our, aligned our work within this global framework in terms of the research we undertake, how we communicate our work, and the range of actors we work with to ensure that gender equality and women's empowerment objectives are at the heart of sustainable development debates and solutions. This is just a global map of where we're working. So please allow me to give you a few illustrations um, from the work of many of my colleagues. So on forests and land rights, C4 has a very long history of documenting progress in handing over forest management rights and responsibilities to local and indigenous communities. C4 researchers working in Uganda and Nicaragua have gone a step further and worked as, alongside women and men in local communities to document the range of rights that women access and how this compares to their male counterparts. The researchers found that there are glaring disparities in rights and yet responsibilities for force management are shared between the genders. They also found that when women feel their rights are secure and not dependent on men's, they are more likely to make investment decisions that are good for them and good for forests. On climate change, um, C4's research on Red Plus, one of the main core and cross-cutting issues, has been tracing whether and how women participate in Red Plus framework from subnational, national to global levels. For instance, across five countries and 60, 60 plus research sites where this research is underway, C4 researchers have found that women know much less about Red projects and are involved in very marginal ways. Hence, in decisions that could fundamentally alter the landscapes in which they live in, women have limited voice and influence. C4 researchers working on Red Plus are actively working with relevant government agencies such as the Ministry of Women's Empowerment and Child Protection in Indonesia, as well as National Women's Machinery for developing principles and guidelines for integrating gender in Red Plus design and implementation. C4 researchers working on climate change adaptation, mitigation, and on the synergies between the two are also drawing on their research to inform a wide range of policies um, at the global level, including the upcoming gender policy of the Green Climate Change Fund. In addition to embedding gender considerations more deeply and systematically in the themes that C4 has worked on, since the center was first set up, we are also actively expanding gender research in new and emerging areas. We are working towards expanding the global debate on corporate commitments to eliminate deforestation from supply chains by monitoring whether women have a meaningful voice in decisions related to land conversion whether corporate practices uphold global standards of decent employment, and whether services that are extended to local communities and smallholders target both women and men. In the process, our work is inf 
is informing alliances and platforms for implementing and monitoring zero deforestation commitment and multi-stakeholder processes, such as those establishing social and environmental standards. One of the major drivers of forest and land use change in many tropical and subtropical countries is migration urbanization. In Nepal, remittances contribute one third of the GDP, and 90% of the migrants are men. We are finding that the impact of male out, ma ma male out migration for women who are left behind can be dramatically different depending on what forest management institutions and social structures they have in their communities. We are actively working with our research and development partners to understand the kinds of policy reforms, institutional changes, and cultural shifts needed to support women who are left behind so that they can be at the forefront of forest management efforts. So in summary, the forestry sector has much to contribute towards combating gender inequalities and enhancing the full enjoyment of human rights by women and girls. But aligning C-Forest work closely with the global framework on sustainable development, we hope to contribute knowledge and, and evidence to advance a global vision rather than strive for results in a peaceful and isolated manner. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivika. Lastly, we will hear a closing remark by Her Excellency Ms. Anna Johansson, Minister of Infrastructure, the Ministry of Enterprise and Innovation, Sweden. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Your Majesties, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. For almost 25 years, C4 has played an important role in carrying forward research and making better use of the knowledge and information available on intersectoral approaches in foreign landscapes. It is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here with you all today. With the Agenda 2030 and the, its SDGs, as well as the Paris Agreement, natural resources such as forests has been acknowledged for playing a much greater role for sustainable development and climate than ever before. Forests and other natural resources are now recognized, both with specific targets, but also seen as an integral part of achieving many other goals and targets, as clearly spelled out in the recently adopted UN strategic plan on forests. Indeed, rather than focusing on individual tar targets, it is the integration across the SDG framework that can make a real difference. With the SDGs, we see the whole world unit in, in one single universal agenda. We have one planet, and it's our shared responsibility to ensure that it can support the needs of the present and the future generations. Sweden is committed to this agenda more than ever. In just a few weeks, Sweden will host, together with the Fiji One Ocean Conference, to focus on Goal 14, conserve and sustainable use of the oceans, seas, and marine resources. Later in July, during the UN High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, Sweden with, will voluntarily report on our efforts to implement the SDGs, both at home and abroad. Sweden has a long experience and long knowledge of restoration and sustainable management of forests and monitoring our forest resources, as well as technology and innovative solutions. We are very happy to share this with the world, and we are at the same time very happy to learn from others too. During this afternoon, I have learned quite a lot on many things, including Indonesia's efforts to tackle deforestation. In addition to its domestic efforts, I'm pleased that Indonesia has negotiated with the EU a voluntary partnership agreement to promote trade in legal timber products. It is clear that this is, has significantly helped decreasing the rate of deforestation. C4 is leading the way here. For many years, C4 and ECRAF have been in the forefront of providing research supporting 
a more people-centered development in which many different sectors intersect and being translated into practical application at the landscape level. Sweden is in the middle of giving new form to forest policy in order to enhance our bioeconomy. Bio the Swedish government has made significant investments in the bioeconomy by allocating resources for research. Furthermore, the Swedish government is working on developing a national forest program. Sweden needs a long-term forest strategy that optimizes forestry opportunities and contributes to the Swedish society and the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. We like our coming forest program to communicate a positive signal about the sustainable use of our forests for the climate, jobs and sustainable growth. I hope that our joint efforts to preserve our forests will have good results. And I also hope that the forests will return to many places that have been deforested and degraded and bring back life and new beginnings. And I also hope that we will move forward realizing that it is possible to use the forest in a sustainable way. Thank you very much for your attention. Your Majesty, the King and Queen, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of today's session, today's seminar, and we have heard how sciences has generated knowledge and how science is now under threat because of this uh, post-factual truth. Let me close today by quoting a quote that I've, the first time I heard it, it stays in my heart. The saddest aspect of life right now is that science has generated knowledge faster than society gains wisdom. Sustainability is about wisdom. And we have heard all the sciences and the knowledge. How can we as a society gathers wisdom. That is our homework. With that, I would like to extend, on behalf of C4, our deepest gratitude to the Majesty, the King and Queen, to the Excellencies, to the distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, thank you from the bottom of our heart. Thank you for being here, and we hope that this has been a fruitful meeting for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may you please stand up. <laughs>